Hi, and welcome to Rule of Carnage. Uh, I'm Glenn Ford, and I'm here talking to Mike Hutchinson about designing better miniature games. Uh, today, we're going to talk about scenarios. Um, it's something that we've mentioned quite a few times in other videos about the fact that um, one of the first things you should write should be a scenario. Um, so we figured it's about time we talked about what a scenario is, uh, explaining why it is that we think it's important you write it, uh, first of all, talk about the elements that make a scenario up, the elements that make up a good scenario, as opposed to just a scenario anyway. Um, so we'll try and get through some of those technical bits and pieces in, um, in the first part. And then in the second part, we'll maybe try and talk a little bit about some, uh, some more unusual scenarios, what goes into a narrative scenario as opposed to a competitive one, a solo scenario, campaign scenarios, maybe talk a bit about why scenarios aren't as well or as heavily played as they maybe deserve to, or at least don't get played as much as, um, as, much as the weight of, of, of attention some of them get anyway. But we'll, we'll get to that later on. For now, uh, what is a scenario? Um, I think a, a quick definition is that most games come with a, let's call it a standard play mode, which tends to be one or another variation on a bunch of dudes line up on two sides of the table, run forward and kick seven bells out of each other. Um, scenarios are anything that alters that story. Um, uh, tweaks that that little game. How we, is that is that a good thumbnail description of a scenario, Mike? I see you pensively considering that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I suppose for me uh, to offer an alternative definition, I think the scenario is the setup instructions and the victory condition instructions, and everything in between is the core gameplay mechanics, um, rather than that. Because I think what you've described is the default assumed scenario, and then there's the variations, which are scenarios as in more ways to play. Hmm. I mean, we'll get onto that maybe later on because you ironically don't that. write things with a with a default play mode. But um, <laughs> I what I suppose one thing to to sort of to start off mentioning is, like I say, a few times we've suggested that a great place to start when writing mm. anything to do with skirmish games is writing your own scenario. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about this actually the other day, and it's it's slightly ironic because when you're writing your own game system, pretty much the last thing you write for your game system is, is are the scenarios. Can be. Um, you tend to get most of the mechanics in play, even the units, and then once you've got them all rolling for for whatever the main play mode is you start sort of tweaking the, the scenarios but i think that's why there's such a good thing uh for budding writers to start with because what you tend to get in game systems are layers of rules um you, you start with sort of anchor rules and then rules that are built on top of those and rules that are built on top of those and so on up and because scenarios tend to be one of the last sort of creamy layers of the trifle of rules building rather than your 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 biscuity or cakey foundation um if you just pull a scenario off the off the top of the game and and wrench it to pieces and pull bits out of it or just dump your own scenario on top there's very little damage you can really do to the to the playground by doing that yeah whereas cool. if you if you go in and you rewrite even an army list or or a weapon or or a character they tend to integrate with each other in a in a more crunchy way and if you go in and rewrite a rule you're potentially just just wrenching the foundations out from the building without really understanding it um do you think that's a a, a fair sort of description as to why it's such a, a a good starting point for budding designers budding writers absolutely yeah although Although with a caveat that you should write a scenario that affects all the players uh, equally. So um, we'll talk about narrative scenarios and asymmetrical scenarios, I guess, a bit later. But for me, um, one really early place that I, I found a lot of enjoyment was writing scenarios where um, there was some froth added on top. There was some fun, random stuff um, that was added on top or um, there was just like different setup rules or different... Um, simple mechanical elements were added in and, and exactly as you say i think the 
the best thing about that is that you can you can alter how a rule system operates but in quite a non-damaging way you can see whether by sort of twisting it left or twisting it right you can find a different play experience but you're not really changing the core engine of the rule system and so um for me messing around with scenarios trying to find what's the limits of what kind of a game you can <clears throat> drift a particular system into accommodating um and just finding out like where um where the limits of where the limits where the sort of elastic limits of a system are where you can bend it so far and it will happily accommodate that and if you bend it further it will break um so yeah i i think the scenarios are a fantastic way of um doing a bit of early games design and trying to get a game experience a play experience that you want but without having to worry about the entire functioning mechanics of a fresh game engine which you know Honestly, you know, you don't always need a fresh game engine anyway. I sometimes wonder why I write a fresh one each time. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are some technical things that, that probably go into a scenario. We'll maybe talk a bit about those. And there are maybe some things that go into a, a good scenario. And hopefully we'll, we'll sort of talk about those um, a little while later. Um, first of all, um, just literally what goes into a scenario. I mean, I, I almost, I almost have like the headers just like memorized at this point. It's just like, <laughs> what's the, what's the little bit of flavor text that describes what's going on? What's the setup rules that might include the deployment rules? Like, what special rules happen as a part of the scenario? Uh, what is the end game end? condition and then what's the victory conditions and sometimes you yep. mix those things up because they're in different places but it's basically how do you get set up what happens during the game when does the game end and who wins that's the four yeah. things you need uh yeah the the what the one thing that i would sort of add on to that that you might sometimes see in a scenario is a uh, special force selection rules if they pop up so i was thinking about some about some sort of classic scenarios you might see it so um for example, uh, starting from the top there, four selection rules. There's uh, a classic sort of uh, uh, setup scenario in the old Warhammer rule books, which is uh, a sort of seven against Thebes um, version of play where one side only gets heroes, gets um, exactly mm. seven heroes, and they're allowed to carry as much as they like. And that's a great example of where basically one section of rules just in the in the little setup section writes a whole story a whole a whole world for you and, and you then there's very little else that needs to be done for that particular scenario um you might uh, tweak other things about force selection rules so for example if you're having a game um that involves uh, an ambushing section uh, a set aside part of the force that that comes in from the side of the table which might be quite popular you might want to put conditions on things like scouts um, or other units that it's usually units that have weird setup rules within the main game that you sometimes want to put a few little uh, controls on in the in the sort of force selection uh, section so th th this is really interesting because i have never written a scenario with four selections and that is quite a deliberate choice and it's, so it's quite interesting because in i'm not even sure i was going to say in big games where you've got lots of options but i'm not even sure what the conditions are but i'll tell you why i don't write four selection things is because um i tend to be writing scenarios which fit within sort of a a core play experience, which is you've given the players a lot of agency, they've spent a bunch of time making hobby stuff happen, and then they bring together their like 50 can Gaslands team or their like, you know, sort of collected sort of five models for Perilous Tales. And then rather than saying, haha, you prepared something and now you can't have it, I just say, in my own mind, I'm always like, well, whatever you brought to the table, let's make that work. Um, hmm. But at the same time, um, I've played lots of, I've read lots of narrative scenarios and been inspired by the idea of creating a specific force. But as we might talk about later, I, I rarely actually bothered to do that. So I think it's kind of interesting because of those things that you, of those things that you need to get in a scenario, that one feels like the one that I instinctively as a designer tends to shy away from. Which is which is interesting, given that in Gaslands Refueled, there's the uh, the sort of the Fury Road na linking narrative scenario in which one side has force selection 
yeah like which is which is actually that, that's 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 a that's a campaign where you're instructed mm. at the beginning like this thing is going to happen rather than um I, I i guess it's yeah it's it comes down to how much preparation you want to mm. you want your pet your players to do and i think uh, yeah if you're if you're committing to something like a escalating campaign where you only get a bit and then you scale up or if you're doing a narrative campaign where you kind of buy into the fact that there's going to be lots of different battles and one's going to be really small and one's going to be really massive and one's going to be really mm. niche and one's going to be really broad um but yeah i guess when you're writing a core rules system i think my instinct is don't add force selection rules to core scenarios but i yeah i totally agree and and you know, I, well, I guess we can sort of get into it a little bit of this now. Is, well, I think one of the conditions that makes a good scenario is that it should be accessible at the table by players. Um, as in, you shouldn't have to pre-study uh, the scenario. We might talk about that a little bit later, but there's nothing more more annoying than having a, a pre-selected list or army getting to the table, being given the scenario and going, well, half of my, my army is kind of moot now because... I bought an ambushing army in this scenario makes half of everybody's army ambush. I paid points for my ambushing and you're getting it free. So yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah, garbage. Totally. Um, maybe, so, maybe that, maybe that actually, maybe what we're, maybe what we're describing here is there are actually kind of two scenario blocks here. One is something that makes an exciting emergent game experience, regardless of force selection. And one that is, inspiring some kind of hobby challenge or some kind hmm. of specifically like reconsider units you previously discarded kind of a, a switch it up because yeah, yeah in in gaslands you've got scenarios like um truckosaurus or hmm. or even the or even the, the the big game hunter where you need to bring to the table a bunch some models that you wouldn't normally bother but if you say hmm. oh in two weeks time let's play truckosaurus and one person goes yeah i'll put my hand up and i'll build a truckosaurus like that's a fun hobby challenge but if you're just yeah. sitting there and you turn up with your with your 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 game cases out the back of your car and you roll up a scenario it goes all right you need to build an entire space station like modular board you're like well i don't I can't. We, yeah. All right. Roll again. Oh, no, totally. And I, and I think that's part of where eventually we'll end up talking about narrative scenarios to some degree. And I think that um, I think seven against the, the sort of seven against Thebes um, scenario is is a great example of a narrative scenario where nobody is rolling up with just seven heroes in their in their army case. Going, I assume I'm going to be playing that scenario for my pickup game at club this week. Um, but when you read it in that Warhammer rule book and it's so mad and it's so out, you, you go, oh, one, one week, I want to organize somebody and play that. I want to have mm. my seven Bretonian knights stood and seeing the hordes rushing towards them. They are going to be so badass. They're going to be like the A team on, you know, out, out, out on the field of battle there. And so I think uh, four selection rules are one that, that it is a it is a thing that can make up certain scenarios it's a very spicy meatball to to throw at somebody um for a scenario that might well be a pickup game um and if you are going to toss it in there and if it's if it's not going to be uh quite uh for, they're going to be very forgiving um be very careful about how you, how you put them in and and then as you said, the, the standard parts that make up scenario. The next obvious one, once you got your forces, the, the setup rules. Um, I think one of the the classic examples of that is is you often see the sort of uh, the Rourke's drift style uh, scenario where you've got a, a group in the middle of the table and they're being assaulted on all sides. Mm -hmm. um, that that's one of the sort of the more popular uh, versions of a weird setup rule or. Uh, somebody being ambushed as they as they march along in a column. So you've got uh, one group that might have to set up uh, on opposite table edges, and then another group who who get to set up on the flank table edges. Um, as you said, the general special rule elements that make up a scenario, the 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 weird things that are going on. There's monsters bursting out of the ground. There's fiery rain coming down uh the victory conditions and the end conditions which aren't necessarily the same thing all of the time um you, it's surprisingly important to ensure that scenario, your scenario has 
robustly and clearly triggered end conditions. Um, Because unfortunately, there are a peculiar number of scenarios that end up technically, and if you play them a certain way, never ending. Um, And certainly a lot that end up having no clear winners and no clear victory conditions at the end of them. So I think um, we, we talked a we talked a fair bit about deployment on a previous conversation. So I think we can probably hmm. skip over that to a degree. I think the special rules are the place that you can add salad dressing. Hmm. Like that that's that's the place where your imagination and your storytelling really like takes form. And we can talk. We'll talk about the victory conditions in a minute. But I think hmm. the special rules are a place that. It's quite a playground. That's a really, really fun place to mess about with. And particularly when you're writing scenarios for a game that you're familiar with, that's a really fun place to mess about with because you can mess with the core rules. You can mess with, you can introduce terrain rules where they're not supposed to be. You can add modifiers. You can do all kinds of things. Um, you can you can have kind of traditional conditional triggering things. You can have like turn by turn things get worse or things get more complicated. You can have random tables of stuff being generated. There's just a ton of cool things that you can put in that just um, change what's happening during the the, the turn. Um, mm. And then I think that the the victory conditions are absolutely the critical thing. And when I'm approaching a new game, like writing the first scenario, it almost always comes down to what's the victory conditions because Having written a, a system that I'm excited by, nothing will more quickly bring that system to its knees than a poorly written victory condition. And mm. quite often, writing the victory conditions and getting them right will make me reconsider almost every part of my game's design up to that point. And it seems ridiculous, mm. but it is actually genuinely true because the victory conditions are asking a question of like, what, what is the important game state that you're trying to reach? And then mm. if it's exciting to get to that game state and if it's tense and if it's well contested to get to that game state, you have a game. And if the game state is trivial to reach or tedious to reach or takes too long to reach, then you don't have a game, regardless of how enjoyable the mechanics of operating the, the game pieces are. The victory mm. conditions are just like the thing that makes the whole f- dish come together. And without good ones, it's 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 just boring or tedious. Or... Well, I think that the thing is that the victory conditions are what you as a games designer are telling the players they they should be doing this mm. is you saying this is this is what you should be trying to achieve and then hopefully somewhere in your game there is the thing that is fun to set about doing and if you don't have if those two things aren't generally the same process if the thing that you're telling them that they have to do to win isn't also the thing that you've made enjoyable for them to do Mm. you've just created one of the most unpleasant tabletop experiences i i I for one i think you 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 can sort of go through it's like there have been game systems that that i won't mention where we've played i've gone in crushingly won the game you know snuck in scalped out all of the victory points not taken a wound slipped out again and meanwhile you and other people are laughing uproariously as you deeply enjoy horribly losing the scenario <laughs> and that, and it's like no but i was doing what i was what i was meant to be obviously that was what i was meant to be doing that's what the game system was built to ask me to do why was it like accountancy in a world of gray you know sludge what it was that was just i completely crushed it and now what's even worse is it's a campaign system and part of my reason for crushing in that is that i get to buy all the fun toys for the next game but you're not going to play because you got crushed during the first scenario having so, fun so so this, this is this is a really interesting and problematic thing with uh, a billion sons actually which is if you approach billion sons with the perfectly legitimate um, sort of understanding that this is a game where you shoot spaceships and spaceships explode and then you shoot some more spaceships and more spaceships explode because that's literally the picture on the front of the book is that <laughs> there's a bunch of exploding spaceships and then you analyze the victory conditions and you go hmm okay so i need to spend some i need to s- send some space trucks in 
and the space trucks need to do some space trucking and I might need some guys to stop my space trucks from getting held up at the border. And I think that's one of the things that people initially, um, it's one of the reasons that people are asking me so often for the war zone scenarios, the scenarios where everything is about just killing everything because mm. they come in with an expectation that this is an exploding um, shooting things up game, which it, which it is to a degree, but when you analyze mm. the victory conditions in a really um, uh, kind of clear-sighted way, you go, oh, okay, the game is not actually about killing. Killing might be part of why on the emerging table states that it becomes the right choice to do. But ultimately, I haven't been told you've got 200 men, I've got 200 men, the fewest men remaining will lose. <sighs> I mean, one of the things, and uh, I, I agree with you, one of the things I always feel about games which give you victory, move you towards victory by virtue of you killing another um, model or another participant, you know, on the table. And it's something I think I've, I've mentioned before um, to you when we've been designing things, is that I always think that it's like double dipping um, within the game, where it's like, if I if I kill your guys... I'm going to achieve whatever it is I want to achieve because there's going to be nobody to stop me and I'll tool around the table picking up all the all the lovely pennies and blowing up the buildings, whatever it was I was trying to do because you guys are all just mouldering corpses and so I can do whatever I want. Um, so a game that says you get directly rewarded for killing people is a game that that's sort of a an overly... Um, a sort of overly underlined part of part of the victory conditions any game that says do anything is a game where you get rewarded for killing the other people well i think i think that's i think that's why and this might be bleeding into the second half of the conversation but i think that's why scenarios that are more fiddly in inverted commas than just blow the other guy to pieces become quite problematic because if the system and the expectation of the scenarios in those systems is blow the other guy up then you can't really introduce as you say you can't really introduce a and complete objective because complete objective is easier if you're blowing set seven bells so always blow seven bells possibly engage with scenario but that's always a secondary concern i mean it's it's funny and i and i you know not to be unkind here but it's where you're actually asking someone to actually think in a strategic and tactical manner rather than just come to table, employ pre-built engine to do what pre-built engine does, push lawnmower across table, look at devastation left by lawnmowers passing, pat yourself on back and walk away. The, those, some of those victory conditions go, uh, you know what, you'll actually have to think strategically about what you need to hold and why you need to hold it and and which units are now suddenly expendable that weren't before and and you know why you're actually doing things and and i, I know and like but, i say and, we, and, we, and that and that is why that is why scenarios are worth writing and i think that's why we uh, yeah. believe at the very least you should have six scenarios with a d6 table so that when people turn up to the table you have at least asked them they don't have to hmm. at least ask them roll a dice and you'll find out which of the six victory conditions and sort of strategic questions have been laid in front of them and yeah. at minimum i think that's what you should offer players mm. and, I, and again i think it might be stepping on the toes of the second half of the conversation here a little bit but part of me suspects is that one of the reasons that scenarios aren't as heavily played as maybe it'd be nice that they were is that they actually ask people to do some proper thinking at the tabletop rather than, you know, there is there is a degree to which people want some thinking, but not too much thinking. I want to I want to think about how I employ my my lovely pre-built engine, but I don't want to have to think on the tabletop, go back in and re-tinker with the engine and figure out oh, which bits of it can do this bit and which bits of it can do that bit. I kind of want to coast a little bit so do and you, when people do you think do you think then that there are because i see exactly where you're coming from and i think that they're potentially do you think there are two kinds of um tactical challenges then there is the armchair gaming complicated list building of 40k and warhammer where it doesn't really matter like having the same scenario again and again or only a small variety of scenarios 
is reasonably satisfying still because the technical challenge of list building is good. Whereas if you've got something where the list building is relatively low key compared to that sort of a exploding options, then what you're given and the challenge that you have to do, like that's where the, it's much less armchair and much more at the table. Um, yeah, yeah, is I it, do. Is it, um, if those two things would give you a way of saying, well, is my game, is my game super list building heavy or is it super at the table heavy? Because like that's yeah. like there's a ridiculously like the skew of a billion suns is like why don't we try oh, yeah, yeah. game that's entirely that thing and not at all that thing um mm. but i think that if you're trying to write a game which is an armchair game of friendly thing which is okay i'm going to provide a lot of overlapping options with interesting intricate interplays and by discovering those interplays and and sympathies i will discover a lawnmower then maybe you don't need place as much emphasis on the scenario in your design oh possibly um i need to track back a, a little bit just for a second and talk mm -hmm. about the, the the special rules that you do put into a scenario because i think mm -hmm. it's worth saying and you, you i think you mentioned it at the top is being fair and affecting everybody equally um which is which is not nothing and it doesn't come about naturally um mm -hmm. and it genuinely takes quite a bit of focus to make sure that oh oh just a minute i thought this particular special rule where a thing bursts out of the ground affects everyone equally but actually if those guys are faster they're all gonna hit the things that burst out the ground first because they you know or if this is a close combat army and that's a ranged army and things just burst out the ground you could say well look, everyone's on the ground it's like yeah but only one of the armies has got to run run across it to, to mm. get to the other side um so making sure that all of your special rules are genuinely equal and genuinely affect both sides evenly yeah. um, is very important. Also, making sure that special rules aren't too fiddly or too complex. Um, you know, one or two D6 tables is fine. Embedded tables in a scenario is a little bit of a... a, a a frightening prospect for people where it's okay roll a d6 and that d6 says roll a d6 on this other imp table and yeah that might be a bit too much and it's simply because when somebody hasn't pre-seen the, the scenarios ideally should be discoverable at the table somebody should be able to come to the table see the scenario for the first ever time in their life and have some solid idea of what's going to happen and what sort of tactical challenges are going to come across uh, they're going to come across during the game as soon as you put in like an embedded table or or a table with it's shifting um probabilities across the table that's a lot for someone to take in what the probability of is is of them encountering the thing that's in the embedded table during the game uh, and sometimes you do get some of these special rules where an, the thing from one of these tables pops up and it changes the game. And someone's like, I, I had no way of knowing that that was going to be there. It's like, well, you could have. You could have done the math and figured out the probability and calculated it and put something in to, to allow for it when it came up. But people don't want to do that and they shouldn't sort of shouldn't be forced into it at a, at a, at a moment's notice. Uh, after victory conditions, as I say, they, the end conditions of a scenario. Um, now, again, this is a funny one where end conditions aren't directly connect, aren't directly part of victory conditions, but they are a very important part, certainly of narrative scenarios. Um, if a scenario is trying to tell a certain story, it's important that when the story juice is sort of used up, the scenario ends. The, the, there's nothing more tragic than having a narrative scenario where the, the big moment has happened and then there's like two turns of people just scurrying around a tabletop or, you know, the, the, the last turn movement of somebody suddenly for some reason turning away from the main battle line and running over in a random direction to stand on a hill um or the last dude of a particular unit who is suddenly worth 20 times his normal victory points because he's the last guy of a unit running and hiding down a well at, at the last second because everyone knows this is the last turn and it's time to secure some last second victory points um 
So I think it's why often you see random um, turn limit end conditions in games is to save everybody from that sort of acting like a complete lunatic on the the preordained final turn of the game. Um, I think it's nice uh, sometimes. One of the things I think that came up with A Billion Sons was that the turn limit, the game limit ends when the various condi- uh, uh, contracts are paid out. Mm-hmm. Um, so the game ends when there's no more juice left in the game to play. And that, I think, funnily enough, it came from us playtesting. And originally in playtesting, um, A Billion Sons had a much longer turn limit. And it just turned out that everyone jumped out on about turn three. And then there was like a couple of lit ships dotted around on turn four that had nothing really to do. And it was like, well, if you have to jump out to take your ill-gotten gains with you, and so everyone's jumping out on turn three anyway, the only thing you're considering doing on turn four is jumping in a new set of ships and restarting the cycle. Um, That was sort of where we made the decision to say, okay, it ends when the contract is paid out and the contract pays out in three turns. Well, um, and also, and also, and also in a billion suns, there was a, um, there's an entropy built into all normal games where you start with 2000 points and then stuff gets blown up and the game becomes faster and more con- kind of condensed. But in a game with infinite reinforcements, there's no such entropy. Um, to a degree and so mm. like what having a turn limit or or an objective sort of triggered end game thing is it puts a pressure on the situation where it's like you can't just sit there for three turns not deploying anything looking at the other guy and going well are you going to deploy something well are you going to deploy something like you need to put some pressure on the situation where um as soon as somebody makes a move like boom the clock is ticking fast mm. i think the, the, I, i've got many feelings on this topic so um one feeling I have on this topic is that uh, one of the things that people talk about in um, A Billion Sons is that it's only three turns. Literally, people mm. have written, it's only three turns. I'm not sure it's worth playing a game that's only three turns, which mm-hmm. is a mind-boggling statement. But it comes, <laughs> from, it comes from a default turn setting from Warhammer, which is there are six turns. That's the number mm-hmm. of turns that there are in a game system. Like that's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. The number of turns in a system is how long does it take me to play a ninety minutes to two hundred uh, to, to two hour long game? Like that's the number of mm. turns. And if there are a small number of units that take faster uh, to activate, let's have twelve turns. If there are a large set of armies that take a lot of uh, activations, like let's have three turns. It doesn't. It doesn't mm. matter. It just matters how much juice you squeeze out of it. Um, and so, like. The other thing is that there are only three turns. Well, in Warhammer, turn one is boring. Like, turn one is Mm. just move everything, nothing happens, a cannon shoots a general, the end. Like, I don't want that turn. That turn was thrown out of a billion suns, and you cut straight to turn three, just like a Mm. novel where it just goes, things were exploding all around her, and she ran bleeding into the, like, like Mm. starting the action. So that's my my first uh, sort of feeling is, Turn limits are there exactly as you say to like explain when the excitement needs to end, but I think also to like apply some pressure at the front of that. Mm. So it's it condenses the action into something that's exciting and has a has a definite end. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 bizarre how many game systems have are for whatever reason arbitrarily plumped for six turns as the turn limit. Um, it, it six turns turns up more regularly than than you would probably expect within skirmish games, and I don't think it's. I think that a depressing, not depressing, but a, a sad amount of the time, the turn limit is the point at which there will be nothing more interesting of any kind to occur whatsoever, um, and I would far rather see a game where it, that says, okay, at the apex of the of the fighting at the point where it's right on a knife edge that's when we're going to call it that's what you've got you've got to be one millimeter ahead on the correct turn rather than well it's all decided now anyway you know yeah we i mean just... we, look, we we know from board games where the playtime is much condensed that you 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 mustn't outstay your welcome 
and hmm. for miniature war games because of the amount of stuff that's involved i think miniature war games um traditionally are happy to act, outstay their welcome because they mm. they can be quite leisurely stately affairs where you know you turned up with you know 600 miniatures and you just want to play for the rest of the day and so forth and i think that almost games that play in 45 minutes and you can play three of them in an in a club session they're almost like slightly looked down on as well you know mm. that's not a that's not a full bodied miniature game experience it needs to take three hours or or, or it needs to go home um so I think that I think that that is a consideration because I do think that players have an expectation, which is it oughtn't to be forty-five minutes. Like that's just a, you know, that's a, it's okay for a for a card-based board game to take thirty minutes or forty-five minutes, but that's not a that's not a serious amount of time for a miniature game. And I don't necessarily have a stance on that. I just think that's a consideration for the market. Um, mm. But at the same time, I totally agree that rather than a game finishing on turn six, but everything that was interesting happened on turn four and no, no further, like fine, finish the game on turn four. Because if the game ends on turn four, then it just adds a bunch of panic and chaos to the end of turn four, where you're like, oh my goodness, I've got to make a bunch of hard decisions. And rather than having a bunch of non-decisions happening in turn fours and five and six, where it's like, well, obviously I'm going to do this, and obviously I'm going to do that. Like force all the, okay, I can only do one of the exciting things, which one's going to get me the most victory points i'm going to have to just do that even though it's the more risky mm. i think that's actually that's actually one of the reasons why the other feeling that i have which is um um i don't like random turn limits i really really like as a player not as a designer i really as a player i like knowing how many activations i've got left to solve the puzzle that my the the scenario author and my opponent has laid out in front of me and so um when when the victory conditions aren't kill everything and a puzzle has been put in front of me if i try and execute the best solution for that puzzle and then there's another two turns i'm like well ah the rug got whipped out of me and i know that i'm supposed to therefore you know plan for all three of those scenarios the one where we had five turns the one we had six the one we had seven but that's like that's where complexity turns into work for me i think i think the thing of a random uh term limit uh is that it's just to make sure that there's no there's no known final turn uh, and and i think that that's where a, a random turn term limit is is a little bit of a, a, a tricky thing to get right because if it is like okay i can get what i wanted to done by turn x and there might be a turn x plus one x plus two and then in those other but I, I think i think that's turns. i think that's as achievable by having a slightly shorter game than you expect as it is by having a slightly more random game than you'd expect so the the sort of yeah. scenario where we do all of the kicking each other in the face and then we sort of march back and i sit on the toilet and you sit in the castle and you know that's where we have to mm. do turns five and six are us like going back and sewing our little tapestries of how we won like that's mm. boring and the reason that it's boring is either you didn't know that you had those you knew you had those turns you had perfect information that you had those turns or the game is two turns too long and like mm. don't give people time to write their tapestries just like finish the game where it's like oh my god ah we didn't have time yeah. and i didn't get all the victory points but did you squeak one more than me okay exciting yeah, it's it's like make it so that there's a really important job to get done and you get that job done at turn X rather than, OK, there's like seven different jobs and I prioritize them from one to seven. And then now that I know that it's the final turn, I might as well have Jimmy, who's doing nothing better on the battlefield, than this, run off, run off and pick up number seven he can pick up number seven he's got nothing else. he's just gonna run over there and jump in the port loo and sing a little song and there we you know whereas it, yeah if you end it at a sharper end of things it's like there is no little jimmy available everybody's pitching into the actual question that we're actually meant to be answering and just yeah just make it about that all right um, so to, to round to round off this technical discussion of scenarios glenn how right. many scenarios should your skirmish game have uh six 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 is the correct answer roll a, d6. Is, is, roll a, roll a d6 as, as many why not one why is one the wrong answer 
I think. Well, I think. Um, I, I, I think my my actual feeling is that um, it, you should have as many scenarios as you can ask interesting questions about parts of your game system. That's that. That's a slightly longer and more more clunky answer. Uh, like so, for example, in in Gaslands, I really wanted there to be the the Saturday Night Live scenario, which asked a question about how you generate votes. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got uh, uh, the the race scenario, which asks a question about racing, which is the main scenario. You've got the uh, Arena of Death scenario, which is a question about blowing things up. You've got the Saturday Night Live scenario, which is about um, picking up your votes and then you've got a, a handful of narrative scenarios you've you've got the the zombie smash which is basically well the, the, the zombie one is a combination of like of other things which is basically can you dry can you pull donuts in the desert effectively mm. which is genuinely a, which is genuinely a part of that game which needs to exist yeah and it's the thing and it, honestly if if you've got a scenario that asks a question about a, a subsection of the game or or a, or a subsection of testing your players in an interesting way that you haven't tested them previously mm. that scenario needs to exist if you're writing a scenario because you've got five scenarios and mike and glenn said that you needed six scenarios and what scenario six does is it tests pretty much what scenario one tested then just five scenarios would be absolutely fine with no, you have to have six in. you heard it here. <laughs> put in put in that number six can be pick a scenario of your choice rather than roll on a, roll on a dice roll number six should be um, flag tag always have a flag tag. how many scenarios are in gaslands refueled <laughs> uh there 15 right there yeah there you go then um so some things to put in a good a good scenario should be flexible um it's good it's a good idea to allow players to maybe tweak it a little bit especially if they want to play it multiplayer um it should be fair um you, you shouldn't be doing things that will favor one player over another um it should be fair and also satisfying in the way that it pays out um discoverable rather than learnable is a phrase i like about a good scenario so i don't want to feel like the person who won the scenario won it because they learned the scenario before getting to the table i don't want it to be that whoever owns the book is probably going to be the one who suggests we play a scenario and then be the one who's going to win the scenario i want the scenario yeah. to be one that you i can have presented to me discover at the table and have yeah, uh, that, a that solid chance more, more than anything like you mentioned before that's a question of simplicity like are the special yeah. rules and the victory conditions transparent and understandable enough that explained once they're obvious yeah and i and it should be it should vary from the core game in a way that's both new um but logical yeah you know, what i what i don't want is a scenario that, that does make make any sense given what the 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 more core version of play is i don't want to sort of have a core game which is about everybody killing everybody else and then a scenario which is about everybody going down to a tea shop in order to find the best doily and then wear it as a hat whilst dancing in the street in circles you know it, there needs to be some logical attachment to what i've tried to do in my previous games and what i am now trying to do in in this game um i would say i mean for for wrapping up this section of the conversation what i'd suggest to people is find a, a system that you enjoy and that you know well find a scenario that that you already enjoy and you already like and just tweak out a few things that haven't sat well in previous plays maybe you play the the scenario as a multiplayer and it was designed for for two players and maybe you find you hitting a piggy in the middle situation write some rules to, to to pan that out maybe it turns out that a particular scenario overly favors one of your friend's armies and not another and just maybe try and tweak it a little bit to, to even it out um then offer it to your friends to play and then keep tweaking it until they ask to play your version of it um and keep tweaking it until your friends ask if you've written another scenario um and once somebody says you know if, if, if you've got a version of this scenario, if you've got one of your scenarios, that's that's a great sign that you're ready to start writing something a bit more involved. You know, that's when maybe start writing a campaign system. We can get onto that 
at a at a later point for uh for another video mike is there anything that you want to add to to that part of the conversation no mike, that's perfect okie dokie fantastic so um wherever you found this uh there will be a comment section uh, let us know what you think and what you'd like us to talk about in the future. Uh, we'll sign off for this video and there'll be a second part coming up soon enough. Um, it is also available as a podcast uh, for longer painting sessions. Um, either way, reach out to us on Twitter or any other social media. But until next time, uh, I'm going to say goodbye for now. Ciao, Bye. Ciao.